Thank you all for attending this intro to Unity workshop. Today I'm going to go over the basics of Unity. I'm going to kind of start with the expectation that you really know nothing about Unity, or maybe it's been a few years since you've been into Unity. Um, I'm not going to go over everything coding-wise. I'm going to kind of assume you know a little bit about coding, but if you don't, that's okay. I'm not going to do anything too complicated. Just a few lines of code is all we're really going to be writing. put together this little demo of kind of what we're going to make. It's just a kind of a basic Flappy Bird clone, nothing too too advanced in here. A few post-processing effects. You, know, you got a player controller and you could easily die and explode. I will encourage you all to ask questions at any point more questions I get, the better it'll be. The more I can tailor this to meet whatever your expectations are, answer any questions. Now to get started, we're going to go into Unity Hub. And if you don't have Unity Hub, you can download this from the Unity website. And once you're in Unity Hub, you can go down to Installs. And you you click on add it'll give you a list of all the different versions of unity that are available right now I'm going to be using unity 2021.2 I just downloaded this yesterday so it should be the latest version of 2021 if you're following along today if you're in the future there'll probably be a different version I've been using 2018 LTS for a long time so I made a little bit of a jump into 2021 so I haven't really played around with it other than just the last, last 24 hours. So there may be some newer features in there that I'm not aware of. I'm just going to really focus on just the basics today. But you could always go in and explore and, and delve further if you want to. So you go through Unity Hub, you'll download. After you go through your, you know, your normal installation process, it'll show up here under Installs. And then you can go to Projects. And once you're in projects, it's your first time here, this list will be empty. If you've been using other versions of Unity, you'll probably have a lot of things popped in here. You have this new button over here. If you have multiple versions of Unity, you could go and select whichever version you want. Or you could always just hit the new button. So I'm going to go and select 2021.2. And after that, you'll get your new project window here. There's a few different templates down here. If you're going to be doing something specific, you may want to use one of these. Uh, there's others you can download as well. I think they're called micro games. Or they've already got a game built in there. And then you can go in and modify those. I haven't ever played around with those. I normally always just go to 3D or 2D. Um, these two are very, very similar. The only difference is pretty much one button which I could show you once we get the project loaded up. All these others, if you're going to be doing VR, it might be a good idea to just download that and use that template. Same with AR. I'm going to be using just the built-in render pipeline. If you get really into Unity, you may want to look at the other render pipelines that are available. There are scriptable render pipelines. If you're familiar with render pipelines and you want to customize a little bit, you could do that. They have what's known as the URP, which is the Universal Render Pipeline. And then they also have the HDRP, which is the High Definition Render Pipeline. If you want to do something you know, targeting higher end software, or hardware, I mean, you want to go with that. If you're just doing a, a generic game, you may want to go with the URP. But the built-in render is actually quite good, and it'll work very well if you're just making a game for Global Game Jam. Now you'll select your location of wherever you want to store your project. I normally put mine within just right on my C drive. I got a folder called Game Dev. I put everything into there. Whatever you name your project, it will create a subfolder within this location, and all the files will be stored within that subfolder. So we're going to be making a little Flappy Bird clone. So I'm just going to go ahead and call this Flappy Bird. Um, 
not Flappy Bird. That way I'm not doing any copyright infringement. And once you've got your name, your location, you'll hit Create. And it'll take a little bit. It'll run through the setup. It's going to build the project for you. Add in a few uh, placeholders just to get everything set up. It'll take, depending on your computer, it could take a couple minutes, uh, maybe really fast, maybe longer. And while this is loading, does anyone have any questions? Uh, why will you want to do a different version of Unity? Um, because over my time, I see little difference, little to no differences. Yeah, it depends. You could look at their patch notes and see what's really changed. Um, I don't know what's really new in 2021 versus 2019 and 2018. Sometimes they rework things like the um, uh, navigation. They've kind of reworked the back end on that a little bit. I think they've redone the input system as well on the back end. Mostly bug fixes. Uh, I usually try to stick with a year or two back any of the long-term support versions because those will have all the bugs and kinks worked out in them. I think mostly, you know, it's it's like an iPhone. They're going to just keep pushing new ones out there. They may not have any new features, but they're going to market it as new features. The biggest difference I noticed with 2021 from 2019 and 18 is that you know, your um, your manipulator controls are on this uh, little movable window by default. But if you want to get the things back where they normally are, you just drop it up there. Um, but it is convenient because you could drag these things around and move them wherever you need to. I am programming in 2021 and I did not know you could do that. Yeah, it's really neat. Um, you can really wow, you can take that. Stuff around. You can move that. Okay, mm -hmm. that's that's. I don't know why you would you, but cool. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, but everything is very customizable. You know, all your windows can be moved around and resized within Unity. If you use Blender, it's not as you no. Know, customizable as Blender for the interface, but it's still quite customizable. If you want to move windows, it's got a lot of snap locations. You could free float things if you want to have multiple monitors. I can put this over on my other monitor. You guys can't see it. But you can move them around. Uh, see, I'm not sure which... I'm in the default view it says, so... Your layout should look like this if you just downloaded. If not, you have this drop down here and you could choose whichever type of layout you want. It's just going to reorganize where all these windows are. But right now I'm in the one that's called default. So what are all these windows we have here? On the left, right now I have what's the hierarchy. And this shows everything that's within the scene. So right now I've got a main camera and a directional light. And when I click on these, you can see all these other windows are changing. So this one right here, right in the center, if you look at this tab, it's called Scene. And the Scene view is where you kind of manipulate the game, where you, you can move through your environment, change things, position things, really get things however you want them. We also have a tab up here called Game. And Game is showing whatever your game would show if you actually were to play the game. This is from the point of view of your camera that's within your scene. So going back to the hierarchy, I've got the main camera, I've got a directional light, and when I click on them, you can see them shown over here in the scene view. Now on the far right, I have the inspector. And the inspector shows all the details related to whatever I have selected. So right now I'm selecting things from the hierarchy, and then the inspector is going to update accordingly. So if we want to do something really simple, I'm going to click on the main camera. 
Now you can see it's selected within my scene view here. And then down in the bottom right, I've got a little preview of what the camera actually looks like. And you can tell it looks like this kind of a horizon. Uh, maybe there's some kind of ground and you see the sky up there. And the reason it looks like that is because we have this option here called clear flags. Right now it's currently set to skybox. You could change this to different options. You know, if you want to stick with a skybox, you could do that. If you want to go with a, a solid color, you select solid color and then right underneath you say background. And you click in that box and now you could change this color to whatever kind of color you want. Now if I click on my game tab up here, you can see that it's changed here as well. So now it's just this solid blue color. If I switch it back to skybox, you kind of got that horizon look there. I'm going to keep it at solid color for what we're doing. Now the next section of this window is the projects view and when you're in projects it'll show everything that you've used within your project all your assets are going to be down here and an asset is just um, it's a some kind of data in some shape or form that you use when making your game it could be a 3d model it could be a sound it could be a texture it could be any number of things that you're going to use to actually build your game and right now the only thing we're going to have in here is a folder called scenes and within that a file called sample scene.unity and sample scene.unity is what we actually have loaded up right now if you look up at the top it'll say not flappy bird sample scene it's got the unity version and then it has a little asterisk up here. And that asterisk means that I've made changes to the scene, but I haven't saved those changes. And that change I made was changing that, that background into clear flag on the camera. So if I try to double click down here, it'll say, this scene's been modified. Do you want to save the changes? If not, all that changes will be lost. So be careful if you're switching scenes because you could easily lose whatever changes you've made if you hit don't save. Now, this is the sample scene. You can easily build your game here if you want, but I'm gonna show you guys how to make a new scene. So if you go down into this assets, right in your project and you're down here, you're gonna go into that scenes folder, right click, and there's a lot of stuff here. You don't have to worry about most of it. Some of it's your normal copy, paste, open. I'm going to go to create. I'm going to look through this list for scene. And if you see it right here, it's about the fourth group down is scene. I'll click that. And I've got this new scene has been created here. And it you can name this scene whatever you want. I'm just going to call it main. Just because this is going to be my main scene for the game that we're going to create. If you're doing a game jam game, you may have only one scene in it. You may have multiple scenes. If you're doing multiple levels, you may want to name them accordingly. But I'm going to make this new scene called main. Double clicked on it and now... It'll say main here, and at the very top it'll say main, so that lets me know which scene I'm in. So, I've got a new scene. Now if I go look at the game view, that solid color I had, that's gone now. Because we're in a different scene. So every change that we made is not in here. That was back in the sample scene. And you could easily switch scenes by double clicking. Um, if you another way you can make new scenes is if you go to this file and new scene, and then it'll do the same thing. It'll 
you some options here. You could empty if you don't want it to have you know, your camera and your light in there, or you could do this built in. This, I believe, is something new they just added in in 21, because I don't remember ever seeing this new scene dialog pop up before. But I normally make them from down here anyway, so it could have been there. I just didn't see it. Okay, so we're in our main scene. I'm going to go back to my scene tab so I can see the world I'm building. Three button mouse is highly recommended if you're going to be using Unity because it's much easier to navigate around with a three button mouse. If you use your scroll wheel, you can zoom in and out. If you click in your scroll wheel, it'll let you pan around the scene. Move left and right, up and down. If you hold your right mouse button down, You'll be able to change where your camera's looking. And then you could use W, A, S, and D to move around like you're in a first-person shooter. I believe they call this fly-through mode. Um, w will move you forward. S will move you back. A moves you right. D is kind of strafe left. Or, yeah, A and D are, are strafing. And then E will move you up, and Q will move you down. If you're new to Unity, it might be a good idea to just spend some time kind of maneuvering around, making sure you could find your way through. Right now, it's kind of hard to tell because there's not much going on here in this scene. There's this grid that's there to help you see where your everything is placed. But that grid will not show up in your game view. It's just there to help you when you're building your scene. So... This scene is kind of boring, so let's start adding some things into here. If you go into your hierarchy, you can, <clears throat> excuse me, right click within your hierarchy and then go down to 3D object and we're going to add in a cube. So now we've got this cube right here in our scene. We got something we can look at and move around. So if I click on this cube within the hierarchy, it's going to highlight it so you can see where we're at. It's also going to give you this little axis here, this triad with these arrows. And then we've also got these little squares here. And these will allow you to move this object around within your scene. So if I want to move it up and down, I can do that. And these squares will limit your movement to a particular plane. So since we are in 3D, I've got three dimensions I can move along. And if I click on this, it's going to limit me to just the red and the blue dimensions. And if you want to know what these colors mean, you could always look over here. You've got this red is X, Z is blue, and Y is green. So I could click that and I can move it around. And now I'm only moving within that the X and the Z. If I lose my place, I don't know where that cube was at. I can't find it anymore. If I click on it within the hierarchy, move my mouse over scene, and push F, it'll take my view right there so I can see it again. Another very useful thing when you're navigating around is sometimes you want to get a pure view. You want to look at it this straight from the top, maybe. You could try and get there using your mouse and keyboard and try and get it just right, but it's much easier if you just click on your axes. In this top right corner, I want to get it view from the top down, so I'm going to click on the, the positive Y axis, which is that green one, and it will take me to a top down view. And right now I'm in what's known as a projected view, which means that I've got some depth to this image. If I want to peer straight down from the top, um, where I don't have all this kind of 3D looking, I could click on where it says top, 
and it will take me into an orthographic view. And orthographic is, is kind of the opposite of projected view, and it allows things that are further away to be shown at the same position. It gets rid of the, the vanishing viewpoint that you have in real life. And if you want it back, then just click it again, and I'll, I'm back in the projected view. Okay. Any questions on navigating around within Unity? Or what any of these windows mean? Well, if not, then we're going to go ahead and get started on making the game. So to start, we're going to focus on making our bird. So if we're making Flappy Bird, we definitely need a bird in here of some kind. So let's start turning this cube into a bird. So right now, this cube is kind of sitting off in space at some random point. It's kind of arbitrary at the moment. I want to make sure I set this back to just kind of the origin of the world. And to do that, I'm going to go over to this transform. And I can either click into these squares and, and type in 000, like this. Or I can click these three dots and go to reset. And it will reset the position of this cube, reset the rotation, and reset the scale. And if I hit F, it's going to take me back to the cube, front and center in my camera. So this cube, uh, it kind of looks like a chicken body to me. So I'm just going to use that for the body of my, my bird. And I'm going to need to add a head to it, I think. So I'm going to go back to my hierarchy, right click. I'm going to go to 3D object. I'm going to add another cube in here. And I want to position it about kind of where I think the head of this bird should be. Now you can eyeball this if you want. Just get it about where you want it to be. Or you could use over here in our inspector, our transform, and type in the numbers of where we want it to be. So right now it's a little offset from this one. I want them to both be kind of lined up here. And if I want them both lined up in this direction, that's the red axis. So if I can't remember what the red one is, you know, I could look over here. In my triad, and it says red is X. So I want to set my X position to zero. That way they both kind of lined up together there. So that looks good, but that head is huge compared to the size of the chicken's body. So I definitely need to shrink that down. And I've got multiple ways I could shrink it down. If I want to go over and adjust the scale here, do that. If I want to say I want my X to be 0.5, I can type in 0.5 into that box and do it that way. Uh, with all of these options here, wherever these X, Y, and Z are, you can click on that X. And if you notice my cursor, it may be hard to see, but there's a little arrow pointing left and pointing right on either side of my cursor. So if I click on that X, I could drag my cursor left or right, and it will change the size of this here. And that works with all of these options here. So if I want to change my X rotation, I drag it back and forth on that and it'll change it. If I want to undo a change I made, Control Z works in Unity. So you could easily Control Z something. I want to set it back to where it was originally. You know, I could go to this reset, but that's going to change everything that I've changed within that transform. So you may or may not want to do that. I'm going to control Z and put it back to where I had it. And I'm going to set the scale back to 111. Now, what if I don't want to play around with numbers and guessing where I want this? Maybe I just want to really just put it where it looks good. I can go over to these options here. And right now, we've got this one selected. And if you hover over it, it says Move Tool. But if I hover over this next one, it'll say Rotate, Scale, Rec Tool, Transform Tool. This is your 
bounding volume, and up here is your view tool. And these are all very useful. Very important that you play around with these, get used to them. Because this is how you can manipulate everything within your scene view. So if I click on a different one, let's say I click on this scale tool. You'll notice that this changed from arrows to these boxes. I'll go back, you can see that I got the arrows. Now if I click on the scale tool, I got boxes. These boxes will let you scale within a particular dimension. So if I click on this green one, drag it up and down, I can make it taller or shorter. Click the X, I can do wider or narrower. You could just adjust it to wherever you want. If I want to change every dimension at the same time, I'll click on this white box. And now I could make it bigger or smaller in every dimension all at once. And that's what I'm going to do for now. I'm just going to make it a little bit smaller that the head of my thing is a little smaller than the body. So that looks pretty good to me. Maybe I want to move it up a little bit. So I'm going to go back to the move tool and then click up and move it up. Now when you're using Unity a lot, you'll get tired of having to go over and click these buttons. And you'll soon come to realize that the top Letters on your keyboard will allow you to change these. So Q, W, E, R, T, and Y will quick select all of these different options. So if I've got my cube selected, if I want to go back to moving it, I'll push W. And I've got my move options here. If I want to go back to scale, I'm going to push R. And then I'll have that. And if I want to rotate it, I'm going to push E. Now rotating may look a little weird to you at first, but once you play around with it, it'll start to make sense. You have all these colors here, and these colors correspond to the axes. And whichever one you select, you're going to be rotating about that colored axis. So if I select this blue circle, I'm going to be rotating about the z-axis. So if I click that blue, and I can drag it and rotate around there. And you can confirm that it is rotating about the z-axis. If you look over at the inspector, as I rotate it, you'll see just the z is changing there. If you are a math person, you know what gimbal lock is, I'm sure, if you've done any kind of linear algebra. Uh, within Unity, these angles here are Euler angles, but within the code, all rotations are handled in quaternions. So it's a little backwards on why they have it one way in the interface and why they have it another way within the code and the scripting. I don't know why they have it like that. But that's just to watch out if you are someone who's a little more knowledgeable on the math of this. If you're just coming into this for the first time, you don't have to worry about that at all for now. So we've got this head here, we've got the body. Oh, uh, I think a bird needs a beak, so let's go ahead and add a beak to this as well. So I can go back into the hierarchy, right click, and then go 3D object to make another cube. Or I could also just select one, hit Control D, and it's going to duplicate it. So now I've got another cube that's exactly the same as that other one. So as I change it between them, in the scene view, you can't even tell the difference. But when I select that second one, I'm going to move it out a little bit. And now you can see there's actually two cubes there. So I'm going to hit R to switch to my scale tool. And I'm going to bring it down in height quite a bit. I don't need the beak to be that big. And I don't need it anywhere near that wide. And then I'm going to push W to go back to my move. And I'm going to position my beak about where I want my beak to be. So now it's kind of starting to look a little bit like a bird. It's kind of boring, all white bird. But I'm going to add some color to it in just a second here. If you want to add anything else to your bird, you can. Maybe you want to add a tail. You could just add another box in here for your tail if you want. I'm going to click this one. I'll duplicate it. Then I'm 
going to hit R to go back to scale, or you can click the scale tool here. I'm going to scale it down. You really can't see where it's at, so I'm going to hit W and move it back a little bit. And all I'm doing is the same thing I've been doing, just adjusting the size, adjusting the scale, adjusting the position, moving it right where I want it. I've got a little tail. Um, I think I want to rotate the tail. So you could either hit E on your keyboard or click here and rotate it. And you'll get really good at, at using these keyboard shortcuts and the tools to really adjust things to get them to look however you want them to look. I think I want to look at it from the side now. So I'm going to go click on that axis, look at it from the side, see how it looks. That looks all right to me. I think I'm just going to leave my bird looking like that for now. Okay, so let's add some color to it. If you click on one of your cubes, you notice there's quite a few things attached to it. We've got this box collider, we have a mesh render, and we have this cube mesh filter. So what are all these different things here? So this mesh filter, this is what's actually controlling the shape. Of what's shown here. It has this mesh option and if I click on this I can change this to any mesh. If I have um, 3D models loaded in to my assets folder they'll be showing up here. If not you're just gonna see your default meshes that are built into Unity. So if I click sphere it's gonna change that to a sphere mesh. Um, I still have a box here which is based off this box collider but the shape of my mesh is now a sphere. But I don't want that. I want to keep it as a cube. But you can change it there. This next section, this mesh render, this is what changes what it's going to look like. You could change the lighting options, your shadow options, and you could also change the materials, how it's going to look. There's a lot of options here. Play around with them. See what it does as you change them. When I turn my cast shadows off, you can notice on the tail, there's no shadow, but if I turn it on, now there's a shadow on the tail. If I turn off receive shadows, now the head no longer makes a shadow on the body. It's back on, now there's a shadow there. But if we want to change our color, what we're going to look at is this mesh, or the, uh, sorry, material. Right now it's using default material. We need to make a new material. So down in our projects window, I'm going to go back to assets and right click in this assets folder and go create. And then I'm going to find material. Once I find material, click on that and I can name this material whatever I want. Your material names um, kind of go with what it is that the material is for. I wouldn't name this red and then make it red because if I want to change the red to an orange later, now my name doesn't match what the material is. So it may not be a good way to go about it. So I'd name your materials based off of what the material is going on to or maybe what the material is. So if you have a wood texture, then you'd probably name it wood. You wouldn't name it floor. But it's mostly going to depend on how you're building things and You'll learn more as you go through and make games. I think I like the body as white the way I have it, but I want to change that head to a different color. So I'm just going to call this chicken head material. So we got this new material here called chicken head material. And I'm going to go over into the inspector once I click on it. Go to the albedo and I'll click on this rectangle that's all white. And I'm going to change this color to something a little different. So right now I have it as red. And now I've got this new chicken head material, but obviously my chicken's head is not a different color right now. So I can do this a couple ways. Easiest way is you click on the material and you drag it and drop it on to whatever you want to have that new material. Another way is if 
you go into that material option from your mesh render, you can click on the little circle with the dot. It'll show you every material available that you have or Unity has by default. You can select it there or you can drag and drop from your assets into that box. Now the beak, I think the beak should be another color. So I'm going to right click, create, make another material. Call it beak. And let's make this kind of a yellowy color. And drag and drop it up there onto the nose. Um, maybe I want the tail to match the head color. So I'll drag and drop it there. Now this is an example of why naming your materials is kind of important because now I've got this material called chicken head, but I've got it on the tail. So maybe chicken head wasn't the best name for this material. I could leave it like this and now things will start to get messy because you'll make these little things here and then you'll say, that's all right, I'll remember it later. But as you add more and more to your game, you're going to start to not know what's what. And eventually you'll be like, oh, I want to change the of my chicken's head maybe I want it green and then the tail change and you don't know why this is just says chicken head so be careful with how you're naming things I'm going to rename this now I think to maybe chicken secondary color so I can right click on it and go to rename or if I left click once and then wait a little bit and then left click again it'll also let me edit the name of this object. Okay. So I've got my chicken here. If I go over to my game tab, I can see my chicken. But I, you know, if we're doing Flappy Bird, I don't think I want the chicken coming at the camera. So I think we need to rotate our chicken a little bit. So if I wanted to make him line up with the camera, I'd come over here and well, you may think you could just rotate him, but now you got all these cubes here and you're trying to rotate them and well, now that doesn't look anything like it's supposed to. So how can we change this? So we're just changing the whole chicken at one time. We just want to rotate the entire chicken. And what we're going to do is we're going to create a game object that has all of these cubes within it. So what is a game object? Everything within this hierarchy is its own game object. So this camera is a game object, this directional light is a game object, each of these cubes is a game object. And within Unity, when you get into the scripting, the game object is kind of the, the base class of a unit, more or less within Unity. And every game object has a few common attributes. And if you look in the inspector, you'll see that every game object I click on has a transform on it. While everything else down here may be different, each one always has a transform. And then each one also has a name. And these options here for tag and layer. And you don't have to worry about what this layer and tag means at the moment. This name can be useful. You may need to change it. Right now we've got cube, 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 and cube, so that's not very helpful if we're trying to find something in particular. So you may want to name these something a little more specific. We'll call this chicken body and maybe chicken head. And this one I'm going to just click and then slow click in there again. So I could just write right here, chicken beak, and this one I'm going to just call the chicken tail. So it is a bit redundant. I've got chicken, 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 chicken. You may just want to call it body, head, beak, and tail. But that's totally up to you and how you want to name things within your game. So I've renamed these, but I still can't rotate the whole chicken all at once. So what I need to do is right click and go create empty. So 
Now this creates a new game object with absolutely nothing in it other than the transform and this little top section. So I'm going to rename this to chicken and I'm going to put everything from my chicken within this. So right now this is set off into space, this random position. Whenever you're making a new game object empty, you probably want to reset this and put it back to the origin, zero, zero, zero. Because if I create my chicken and put him into this chicken, I'll show you how to do this in just a second. Now if I rotate this chicken, it's rotating around that point out there. And that's definitely not where I want to be able to rotate him. So I'm just controlling and all that. So you want to reset your empties whenever you're going to be adding things into them. Now I'm going to select all these here. I'm going to click the first one and then shift click on chicken tail. And I'll select all of them. Or you can always click one at a time and hold control and multi-select that way. Now click and drag it and when chicken is highlighted you can see it's kind of a light gray I'm gonna let go and that'll put all of these into this chicken I've got an arrow here on the left where I can expand and contract it and now all of these are children of this chicken game object so I have this chicken now I can move the whole chicken all at once now I want to Move him around, I could select the move tool, and I can move him. Now we've got this chicken that's all one unit. One big chicken that I can move around. If I want to scale him up, now that I've got everything within here, I just click the scale tool and I can make my whole chicken bigger or smaller. I rotate him, however I want to rotate him, move him around, play with him. Whatever I want to do. I'm going to go ahead and reset him, get him back to where he was. Now back in the game view, see I need him to look to the right of the screen. I think I want him looking to the right. So I'm in my game view tab here. I'm going to go click on chicken, and go to my rotation. Now I know the Y axis is up and down axis, and that's what I want to rotate him around. If you don't know which axis you're trying to rotate around, Always go back here into your scene view and look and see here what you're trying to rotate around. But I know I want to rotate around Y. And I know that I want them to go 90 degrees. I don't know, is it that way or is it that way? Looks like it's negative 90. So I'm going to do type negative 90 in the rotation. So always looking the way I want them to. Alright, I think my chicken needs an eyeball. I'm going to quickly add an eyeball to him. Right click on the chicken itself, go to 3D object. Same thing I've been doing before. I'm going to call it eye. And this is the same things. Just moving it around, scaling it. If you've been following along, you're probably getting pretty good at this. Click on your arrows, move it wherever you want it. I think that looks kind of neat. Yeah, why not? Okay, so we've got our chicken here set up. He's just sitting there. Um, let's see, I want my background to be blue. So, does anyone on the call remember how I did that before? It's under your main camera. Yep. Uh, under the background, or the clear flats. Very good. You sound like you know what you're doing with Unity. Kind of a light blue color, just kind of a match the sky type color. 
So we've got our chicken here, a little bird, and we also need a ground. So I'm gonna add in another cube. I'm gonna right click in the hierarchy, 3D object, add a cube. I'm gonna move it down a little bit and scale it up quite a bit. So I'm gonna scale on the x-axis. How much exactly, I don't quite know. But I'm just gonna put in 50. Seems like a good number, make it nice and big. You know, if I go into the game view, I've got this ground here now. It's white, I don't think we need the ground to be white. I think the ground should kind of look like grass. So we're gonna go and create a new material, call it grass. And all we're gonna do is just change the albedo color. So I'll click in that box, set it to green. And then click, drag and drop it on there. So if I go to my game view, I've now got this bird. I've got some ground here. The ground seems a little high. I think my ground should be close to the bottom of the camera. So I'm gonna click on my cube. Oh, see, I didn't name that very well. I shouldn't leave it called cube. I should rename that to ground. I've got my ground and I could either go into my scene view and manipulate things or I could go into my game view and then use the inspector position it. The Y is up and down, so I'm going to move it down a little bit. Okay, so I've got my ground, i got my chicken. Let's, let's try and play the game and see what happens. So if I hit this triangle button up here, let me play the game as I have it currently built. Now when I hit triangle, you notice the screen kind of change colors a little bit. That lets you know the game is playing. You're in play mode now. And just a big watch out you need to be careful of is that if you make any changes when you're in play mode, as soon as you exit play mode, those changes are gone. So let's say I was rotating my chicken a little bit and I decided I really like my chicken there. And then if I hit this triangle again to exit play mode, whatever changes I made are gone. So it's nice if you want to kind of play around with, maybe you want to tweak your movement just right. But if you exit play mode and you don't copy those changes, then they're going to be gone. And we'll... Can I compliment you on your chicken? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, it looked cool. Yeah, if, if you want it, your chicken to look a little nicer, you could always use Blender, model up something in there. But using these unity primitives you can make some kind of neat stuff pro builder is also really good for uh prototyping like this as well if yes you use that you should check that out yeah pro builder is great all right so i've got a chicken when i hit play nothing happens um i think my chicken needs gravity that's probably what's wrong is he needs Something pulling them down towards the ground. And in Unity, whenever you want to add something to the physics system, typically what you're going to do is you're going to add something called a rigid body to your game object. So if I go over here to the inspector, I've got Add Component. I'm click Add Component, and I'm going to search in here for a rigid body. You just start typing, and then it'll come up. We're doing a 3D game, so I'm going to just pick the plain rigid body. If we're doing 2D, you may want to go with this rigid body 2D. But for 3D, we're just going to do normal rigid body. So I've added the bird to the physics system. I'm going to hit triangle and see what happens. And he fell down to the ground. So now we have gravity acting on the bird. But we can't do anything with him. We can't move him. It's really not much of a game at this point. It's just a bird sitting on the ground. And whenever we hit play, he falls down to the ground. So, that's kind of boring. I think we need to add some controls to our bird so we can start moving him around a little bit. So, down in my assets folder, I'm going to right click. Go create 
I'm going to create a new C sharp script because we need to make our bird do stuff. If you're someone who's more into programming, you may have your philosophy on which your classes should be named and what they should do. For this tutorial, I'm just going to call this class a bird and put all the bird stuff into the bird class. Ideally, you'd probably want to break out your behaviors based on what they do for different things. You may want to have an input class. You may want to have a respawn class where you could really customize things and then mix and match later. Very good for, for making a full game. But just for a short demo, if you're doing a game jam game, perfectly good to shove everything into one class for a particular object. So I'm going to call it bird. So now I've got this bird class here. If I double click on it, it will open up this file in Visual Studio. You may have a different IDE that you're using. I really like Visual Studio, so that's the one I use for everything. Unity used to come with Mono Develop. I don't think it does anymore. I'm really not sure. Yeah, that one works great, but I much prefer using Visual Studio. So I've got a script here. As we've got some stuff already inside of this. If you don't know what any of it means, don't worry about it. If you know programming, I've got a bird class I'm inheriting from a mono behavior. And a mono behavior is just any of these components within your inspector. Again, Unity does weird things with their naming where it's one thing here, one thing in the scripting. I think they're just kind of legacy things that have evolved over time. But a component within the inspector is the same thing as a mono behavior. And mono behaviors have a bunch of default functions on them already that you can overwrite and they will plug right into the game engine. There's start, awake, update. I think on destroy might have been obsoleted. I'm not sure. Um, but you could find all this within the Unity docs if you're really looking into something specific. But all we're going to do for now is we just want to make it where if we push a button, we want our bird to flap his wings. It's not flappy bird if he's not very flappy. So I'm getting rid of everything except the update. Update is going to be called every time through the game loop. If you're new to game programming, every game has a loop. And the loop consists of graphics and physics and updating other properties of your game, reading and input, updating your audio system. And most people are familiar with frames per second. That's how fast the screen is updating. Your game loop is running through one time for every frame. For the most part, physics is on its own timing system. But we don't need to worry about that at the moment. So update is just going to be called every time the screen is getting ready to be drawn, is how we could think of it for now. So every time before the screen is drawn, what we're going to do is check and see if the user is pushing a button. And if they are, then we're going to make our bird jump up a little bit. So first thing we need is we need to know which button we're going to push to make the bird jump. And we could do this directly in the code, or we can expose it into the Unity editor so that if we want to change the button from within Unity, we can easily do it. We can make it into a little drop down. Like within here, we've got some different drop down menus where you can select options. We're going to make a drop down for selecting which key is going to make our bird jump. To do that, we're going to create a serialized field attribute. If you don't know programming, don't worry about it. Just know that. That's what you have to put in there to make it show up within the Unity editor. And what we need is a key code. A key code is just a enumeration that represents a specific key on your keyboard or a button on a gamepad. And we're just going to call it jump button for now. 
So we've got this jump button. We're going to set that in Unity to be whatever button we want it to be. But within our code, we really don't care whether it's the A button, the space bar, enter, doesn't matter. We just need to know when someone pushes the jump button. So what we want to do is, I'm just writing some pseudo code. If we jump, if the jump button is pressed, then we're going to jump. Pretty simple. So we need to find out if the jump button is being pressed. To do that in C Sharp, we're going to create an if statement. And then we're going to call the Unity's input system to check if the button's pressed. So if we want to check on the Unity input system, we're going to type in the super secret word of input. And if we put input dot, we're going to go to git key. And then we've got a few options here. We don't, if you don't know what any of these mean, if you got your IntelliSense on, it will tell you exactly what it is. Otherwise, you could go check the Unity docs to see what function does what. Get key down is going to return true whenever a button is pressed. Get key up will return true whenever you let go of the button. And then normal get key without up or down is going to return true while it's held down and false while you're not pushing the button down. It can be a little confusing if you're coming from some different engines. Down, you may think, means that you know, you're holding the button down, but in Unity, down is only going to be true on the frame when you push the button. So if I push and hold it, this is only going to return true one time. So input that get button down, jump button. So what this is going to do is whenever someone presses the jump button, this if statement is going to return true. And then whatever code I put in these brackets, is gonna run. Um, oops, I put button here. That should be key. So, input that get key down, jump button. And when that's true, I want it to jump. So, how am I gonna make it jump? Maybe you don't know, but we know we want it to jump. So, let's create a jump function and worry about what that does later. So now we're just gonna jump. Whenever the jump button's down, jump. Now, something that's very useful is when you're building your game, testing things out, you know, get, get your function set up. Maybe you don't know how to do this. Well, then let's just test it some other way. Unity has this very good debugging system for logging things to the console or updating things within the scene view. You could draw circles and squares and things within your scene view. A uh, really easy way to check if something's working in your code is to use this debug.log. There's a log warning and log error as well, which put uh, red or yellow within the console, which I'll show in a second. But for now, I'm just gonna write out jump. So whenever someone pushes the jump button, going to write jump to the screen. If I go back into Unity, try to run things, nothing's going to work because if you look up here, I've got that asterisk because I have not saved this file. So I'm going to do control S to save all my changes. When I go back over into the Unity editor, it's going to quickly parse through the file, make sure I've got no errors. If there are errors, then it will pop up that I have errors. So I've got my code created, but I don't have that code attached to any objects at the moment. So I really want this code to run on my chicken. So I'm going to take the chicken, select him, take my bird code, and drag and drop it over into the inspector. Another way I could do it is if I go to add component, Start typing in bird, and I can add it in that way. If you add things that you don't want, you click on these three dots, and you go to remove component, and it takes it away. 
Now I've got this jump button here. I'm going to go ahead and set my jump button to spacebar. So I think spacebar is a pretty good button for jumping. Pretty consistent around most games. That's what I'm going to go with. Now, when I do debug.log, it's going to log things out to the console. And you may have noticed this already. There's a tab down here called console. Whenever you have errors in your code, they're going to pop up in here. Whenever you use debug.log, it's going to pop up down here. So I'm going to go ahead and hit play. And my bird's going to fall to the ground. And if I hit spacebar, you see it logs jump right down here in the console. So we know that code I wrote so far is working. But we need to actually make him jump. Let's go back over into our code. So we've got our jump function. We'll go ahead and actually make this jump. So remember physics in Unity, it's mostly tied to the rigid body. So we need to get the rigid body from our game object into our code. And if we want to do that, we're going to use a function called get component. It is a template function, so it will work on whatever types you want it to work on. If you don't know what that means, don't worry about it. You're just going to use triangles here and type in the type you're trying to get. Just like that. So this is going to give me the rigid body from my game object. So in this case, we're on the chicken. I'm going to take that rigid body and assign it to this variable I created called rigid body. Now that I've got that rigid body, what I want to do is whenever I jump, I want to set the velocity to something. And I don't really know what that velocity is going to be, so you know, let's, let's make that accessible within the Unity Editor. So I'm going to make another serialized field. And if you don't know what data type you need, let's just hover over this dot velocity and IntelliSense says that I need a vector 3. So I'm just going to type vector 3. You may not know what it is, but you know that's what you need. And I'm going to call it jump velocity. So now whenever I jump, I'm going to set my velocity to jump velocity. I'll save, go back into Unity. Now you may think all you got to do is hit play and hit your jump bar, and now you're going to jump. But if you do that, nothing happens. And you may scratch your head for a little bit going, why is, why is it not working? I'm pretty sure my code is good. And this is something that even seasoned Unity devs will make this mistake because it's easy to forget. You didn't set any values to your jump velocity. So if I went in and Change this now, maybe I want it live. And I'll click back in my game view, hit spacebar. Now he's gonna jump up a little bit. But as soon as I exit out of play mode, that's gonna go back to what it was before. So you need to make sure that when you change these, you're changing them at the right time. Alright, good to play with them in play mode, get things where you like it to be. I want him to jump that way, so I don't know, is that Z? Let's put a number in there and try to jump, see what happens. Nope, not Z. That made him jump the wrong way. Maybe it's X. Let's put 5 for X and see. Yep, now he's jumping where I want him to go. And So, before I exit play mode, I really like that jump I've got now, so I'm going to click these three dots. I'm going to go click Copy Component. Now I'm going to exit play mode, hit the three dots again, and go Paste Component Values. And that will, whatever numbers I had in there are going to be in there. So next time I hit play, I can go back in here, and now I can make him jump again. Yeah. 
How are we doing on time? A little over an hour in. Uh, any questions on what we've done so far? Okay. Well, we got our chicken here. We got him jumping around. He looks kind of funny hopping around, but he easily goes off camera and we can't follow him anymore. So we need a way to follow our chicken. So let's create a new script and we're going to attach it to our camera that makes the camera follow our chicken. So, oh, what's a good name for it? If you don't know, just take some time, think about it. And if you can't come up with something, just give it a, a foobar name and then rename it once you come up with a good name. So. We want to create a new script. I'm going to right click in my asset window, go create C sharp script. And in this case, I'm just going to call it follow cam. Because all it's going to do is just follow an object. Okay, so I've got my script. I'm going to double click it. And now I've got my code here. So this time we are going to be using both of these functions that are in here. We're going to use the start and we're going to use the update. We know we need to follow a particular object and we don't know what object that's going to be from the code. So we're going to make that settable within Unity. So if you remember, everything in the hierarchy is called the game object. So we're going to create a game object and we're going to call it target because that's the target we're going to follow with our camera. Now, what we want to do is we want our camera to follow the chicken, but we don't want it to lose its orientation to the chicken. So we really want to preserve that the distance we have between the chicken and our camera. Let me go back to the scene view. You can see here's our camera, there's the chicken, and we really want to maintain that distance while we're doing this. So I'm going to go back in here and we need to find a way to store that offset. So we know we need X, Y, and Z offsets. And if we need X, Y, and Z, that's three values. And in Unity, when we're working with X, Y, and Z, we're normally going to use a vector three. And this is a data type you'll get pretty familiar with if you're doing a lot of code. We'll just call it vector three offset. In fact, I'm going to be a little more specific and call it a position offset. All right, now, the code you're going to write is basically algebra. So if you're not good with math, it may be a little more difficult for you to follow along. But what we want to do is we want to find the position of our target and find the position of our camera when we start. We want to figure out what our offset from our target to the camera is. Now, before I do that, we need to know how we get to our position. So, if each of these is a game object, every game object has a transform. And within that transform is our position. So, that's how we're going to get there. We're going to go from our game object to our transform to our position. C sharp, if you're going to go into this contains a this contains a this we're going to be using the dot operator so we're going to go for our target dot transform dot position and that's how we're going to get that now for our follow camera we're already within that game object so we don't need a, a reference to ourself if you wanted you could do this dot transform dot position but you really don't need the this. because We already know this is where we are. We are this. So you could get rid of that. So here's what we're doing. We're finding our position offset by taking the position of our target and taking away our current position. And that's how far off we are. And now in our update, we're going to do the opposite. So we're going to 
Dear Algebra here, we want to find our new position relative to these other things here. So I'm going to create a new vector 3, call it new position. And then we're going to calculate our new position by rearranging this formula here. So if I add this over to this side, and then I'm going to take this over to that side, so my new position is going to be equal to my position offset minus my target that transform that position. So that's how I calculate my new position, and then I need to assign that new position back into my transform. Transform type position equals my new position. All right. Let's go try it out and see if that code works. So I want to go to my main camera. And I want to add that follow cam script in there. And my target. I want it, my target to be the chicken. So I'm going to grab the chicken and drag him into the target there. I'm going to hit triangle to go into play mode. Uh-oh. That's quite, not quite right, is it? I just got this blue screen. So if I really don't know what's going on, I could go back into my scene view, click on my camera, hit F. Now look, it, it put it on the wrong side there. So it should be back over here looking at the chicken. So that tells me something in my code's not quite right. So if I go back over here, I can look at this for a second, and then I realize, ah, okay. So this is wrong way. It should be this minus my offset. And finding these bugs is, may take you a while if you're not knowing what you're looking for. This one I, I put in here on purpose, but your bugs may take a little longer to figure out. All right, save that Come back in, and if you hit play, your camera will be in the right spot. Now, if I jump, my chicken's going to move, and my camera's going to move with it. Eventually, he's going to fall off the edge. But my camera is maintaining position relative to him, so that's good. Let's run it one more time. So, every time I jump, my camera is moving up, too. You see the ground's moving down, so I really don't want that to happen. So if I don't want it to move up, I'm looking at the y-axis, that green one. So I want to make sure that stays the same and doesn't change. So I could do that by going in here, just add a new line of code. It says my new position, and then I'm going to put dot y. It's going to equal my transform dot position dot y. Because I, I want it my new position to be the same as my old position in the y-axis. I don't want that to change. And keep those the same. Save that. Go back to Unity. Hit play. And now when I jump, my camera is going to maintain that height. But the bird moves up. All right. Any questions so far? Um, thank you. Um, I would like you to compliment you on that um, the way you kept the camera in the way, kept the camera. Um, usually, I just use a have a, like another empty object or something like that, and have it just move with the um, move with the um, the x or y position, the y mm -hmm. position of the um, have have a the game empty object comparing to the camera to like. Follow the um, character every way it goes. So, yeah, but, that, but that's I a, that was the way you did. Nice and easy way to do it is like that. Um, okay. Doing it through the code like this gives you a little more control because, like, I could limit it so it's not moving on that Y. Or if I wanted to add a little buffer in here, um, you could as easily add in some kind of linear interpolation or slurping, and you could add in acceleration to your camera. 
really tweak it to be just just the way you want it. Um, but yeah, doing it that way with an empty is, is a really good way to, uh, nice and simple way to do it. Okay, so we got our bird. He's jumping, he's moving. We got the ground, the camera's following him. Uh, flappy bird, you also need something the bird can collide into and explode. And just kind of end your game. So I think that's the next thing we need to add in here, or add in some obstacles. So I'm going to right click back in the hierarchy, 3D object. And I'm going to add a cylinder. And if you look, I'm going to call it a pipe. The position of it's not quite right. It's kind of off in some weird spot in space. So I'm going to reset it. Now it's the same spot as my chicken. But I don't want it there. So I'm going to use these arrows and move it. Um, I think I need it to be quite a bit taller. So I'm going to go in here and maybe not that tall. We'll do that for now. Alright. So we got this my pipe it needs a top on it, so I'm going to right click on the pipe, I'm going to 3D objects, I'm going to add another cylinder, I'm going to call it top. Move it up. Use your scale tool over here if you want to change it, or you can use one of your tools over here within your inspector, add in whatever numbers you want. Need it to be a little bit bigger in size. And everything except the y axis. So maybe I'll try 1.5. That looks good. So I've got my pipe here. And now if I click on my pipe, I can move it up and down, position it however I want it, and get it a good spot. The pipe, I don't think it needs to be white. I think it needs to be more of a pipe color. So I'm going to create a new material for it. Again, this is the same process as color and other things. I'll call it pipe. And I'm going to make it kind of a darker green color, I think. And I think it should be a little more metallic-y looking. So... Take that pipe material, add it to my pipe. Now I can see what it looks like. I can tweak it a little more, make it a little more metallic y, maybe. Smoothness and metallic are going to probably be the, the ones you're going to adjust the most when you're working on textures to get them to look just the way you want them to, along with the color. If you have a texture you've created in another program and you want to use it, you can drag and drop it into the square next to albedo. You can do it that way. Same with height maps, normal maps. If you, you're someone who's used to 3D modeling, you could use all those options in there as well. But just sign, nice and simple, your metallic smoothness, and then the color. So we got a pipe there sticking out of the ground a little bit. So I think the ground needs a little bit of work. Let's take this ground and make it a little bit wider. And that's going to be the z-axis. And you can still see the pipe underneath. So let's add a cube underneath our ground. And put it down here. I'm going to adjust the height scale of it so it's a little taller. And I'm going to move it up a little bit because I'm going to show you guys another a visual bug that happened. And we're going to make this a dirt color. So I'm going to create one more material here. Call it dirt. Make it a little brown. Something like that. I'm going to go into my game, hit play. Got my pipe there, and I can get my bird over if I jump enough times. And then he falls off again. Okay. 
So I've got my pipe there, but you may notice that when my bird gets on top of the pipe, he, he hit an invisible barrier there. I don't know if you noticed that or not. Right there. There's a little invisible something he's colliding with. And if you're using the primitives in Unity, you may not know what's going on. But if I look at my pipe, you'll see that I've actually got a capsule collider on here that it's colliding with. And if I go back into my scene view and look at it, this is what the collider shape is. And that's what the chicken is going to interact with. So even if I try to jump over the pipe, if my chicken goes right there, it's going to register as hitting that pipe. And that's not quite what I want. So I'm going to get rid of this collider. I'm going to click those dots, remove component. And I think that's good there. And I'll hit, the chicken would be able to slip through right up there. So maybe I need that a little bit different. If I go over here in this capsule collider settings, you can adjust these and get it right where you want it. Play with it that way. You may come to the realization that you really don't like this. You, this, this capsule shape really isn't a good fit for a pipe. So we can just get rid of that. But we need something on there. And since our game is, is kind of it's two-dimensional-ish, now we're 3D, but two-dimensional-ish. You learn different shortcuts and things. And here, I think a box collider would be a much better fit. Because we can match that box up to the shape of our pipe. So when we do collide with it, it's going to be colliding with that shape there. Instead of that round shape up there. So look at that, that's much better. You can see he's colliding with the top of that before he falls off to his doom. Okay. So we got a pipe there, but the chicken's still around after he hits the pipe, and he really should be gone once he hits the pipe. So I think we need to go back into our bird script and make something so that when he hits something, he's going to explode. I'm going to our chicken. Right now he's got that same collider situation we had with the pipe. He's got all these different colliders on him. He's got one for the nose, one for that. And since we've made him out of cubes, you know, these all match up pretty well. But we really don't care if his nose hits something or his tail hits something. It's really mostly the body of the chicken that we're worried about. So let's go and I'm going to shift click, get all of these, and once we're going to go to remove component, and we're getting rid of colliders off of all of those things. So we just got one on the body of the chicken. And really, you may not want it there, especially if we're going to do some code on this to know when he's hitting something. We really probably are more concerned with the chicken as a whole than we are any body part of the chicken. So let's get rid of this collider off the body of the chicken. And we'll go back to the chicken. Just the chicken itself. I'm going to add a collider here. So I had a box collider. And I've got a. It's kind of hard to see it. It's right around the, the shape of the chicken. You can barely see it around there. But that's right on. Now in Unity, there's two different types of colliders. There's triggers, and then there's just a normal collider. And the difference is going to be how it's handled in code. If two objects are colliding that don't have a trigger, it's going to be considered a collision. If there is a trigger, it's going to be considered a, a trigger event. 
and you may know which one you want, you may not know which one you want. In this case, we're going to turn the chicken into a trigger so that whenever it collides with something, it's going to trigger something in our code. Now if I hit play, you see the chicken, and he's going to fall right to the ground because he no longer is a physical object with that trigger on. He's just a trigger. Now I've got him as a trigger, so we're going to go back into the code. I'm going to switch over to my bird script. I'm going to add a function in here called on trigger enter. And now I could write code that will happen whenever something enters the trigger. Um, now if I decide really, I really think he should stop on the ground, I could not make him a trigger and I could use a function called on collision enter. And this is a big source of bugs that people new to Unity will run into because they'll be using a function here but then they'll have the wrong setting here and it can go back and forth and you don't know if you're in the right one or not but if you have is trigger checked you're going to use the on trigger enter function if it's not checked you're going to be using on collision enter in our case it really doesn't make a difference which one you use you just need to make sure that if that box is checked using this top function if it's not checked using this bottom one So what we want to do is whenever he collides with something, I think we're going to just you know, make the chicken vanish. We're going to kill the chicken. So let's create a function or use a function known as destroy. And we're going to destroy our game object. So whenever he collides with something, he's just going to disappear. Add that code in there, go back into Unity, test it out, see what happens. Hit play. And you hit the pipe and he's gone. So, well, that, that works. But it'd be nice to have a little more something happening whenever he hits that pipe. So... I think a good thing to happen is make an explosion. So whenever he hits the pipe, he explodes. Explosions! Yeah. Yay! There we go. Uh, and I've also got some kind of bug going on here too. So see this this red thing here? It's telling me there's some kind of error in my code. And this one here is a fairly common uh, error that you'll see quite a bit. It says missing reference okay. exception. If you click on it and you can read what it is, it'll tell you exactly where in your code it is. It's in this follow cam CS line 19. So if I double click on that, it'll take me right to that line of the code. And it's getting to me this error because I'm trying to access this target and the target no longer exists. Um, C sharp, you have the null operator, which I don't know if it'll work in this case. Probably not. But what you'd want to do is, before you run this code, I'm just going to check and make sure that my target exists. Because that error happens when my bird is being destroyed, but the camera is still trying to access it. So if, if my target equals null, which means it no longer exists, then I'm going to return. And I'm not going to run that code below it. So now whenever that bird gets destroyed... We won't be getting these errors down here. Okay, so let's work on our explosion. So I'm going to right click in the hierarchy. I'm going to create a new effect. And I'm going to add a particle system. So here's our particle system. We're going to work on making it look more like an explosion. And let's rename it explosion as well. 
So particle systems have a lot of different options in Unity. Very, very powerful and can be quite intimidating if you're not used to this and you don't know what all this means. But you can always go through things one at a time if you're not really sure what you're doing. So to start with, explosion should not just be going up. An explosion should go in every direction. So I'm going to click on shape. And instead of this cone shape, I think it needs to be a sphere because it needs to explode in every direction. So that looks pretty good, but explosion doesn't keep happening. It, you know, it's one big burst and then it's done. To change that, we're going to go to the emissions. We're going to go to emissions. And right now it's set to this 10 rate over time, which means every second it's going to create 10 new particles. Um, I really don't want it to keep creating particles every second. I want it to do a burst. And underneath there's this burst. Click the plus, And I can set this to however many I want to happen. So it's going to burst. And then that's it. But it keeps going, and we only want it to go once. So up near the top, we have this looping. We can turn that off. So we hit this restart. It's going to burst. And that's it. All right. Very cool. An explosion. We can tweak this more and get it to look however we want it. But for now, I'm just going to leave it like that. And... We're going to turn this explosion into a prefab. So grab your explosion, click and drag it down into your assets folder. And now down here we've got explosion and up here it turned blue. So I'm going to delete it from there. Now a prefab is, it's a, you can think of it as like a template game object. I could add this in here. I could add another one. Now I've got two explosions in here reposition them and whenever I hit play I'm gonna have two explosions going off now if I click on the prefab down here and make any changes to it maybe I change the color a little bit so it's more orangey whenever I make those changes it's gonna make that change to every instance of the prefab I don't want them in the scene. I just want an explosion. So we've got our explosion, and now we need to add it to our code somehow. And a good way to do that is back in our bird class, we're going to add a way to add it within Unity. So we're going to make this serialized field. Remember, everything is a game object. So we're going to have a game object called explosion and we're going to add it back into this on trigger enter so right before we destroy our our bird we're going to add an explosion to do that we're going to call a function called game object that instantiate and we're going to pass in the explosion so there's multiple different overloads of this function but what we want to do is we want the explosion to happen at the same spot as our bird. So we're going to pass in our transform.position and our transform.rotation. So that our explosion happens right where our bird was. Now we'll hop back into Unity. I'm going to click on the chicken. And that's where I got my bird script. I'm going to take my explosion prefab, drag it into that box, hit play. Now when my bird collides with something, he explodes. Okay. So now we've got the basic gameplay in here. A little flappy bird. Where you can jump around and whenever you hit a pipe, you explode. There's many different directions you could go from this point. Getting your core gameplay in is the most important. Once you've got things in there, you could start adding in more obstacles. Maybe I want to add one that's upside down. 
rotate it around. my game. Oh, really fell too fast and I just went to the ground and crashed. I think my ground is running out too soon so I'm going to scale it up in the x direction. Instead of 50, maybe I'm just going to do 500. And I can go back into my scene view. I got all this ground here. I could keep adding in pipes, building my level however I want it. And keep going that way. Let's try doing that. That didn't quite work. I don't think there's enough room there, so maybe I need to tweak that a little bit, move the pipe up, and position it. And that's kind of where your, your next step is, building out your levels. So, getting your core gameplay in, test out some levels. Once you get everything kind of the way you like it, the next thing you're going to do is move on to adding some visual polish, make things really pop and look the way you want it to look. got 20 minutes left so I'm gonna open this up and see if there's anything you guys want me to add in here any specific things you want to see um, maybe post-processing reloading scenes um, maybe can adding you, some kind of yeah can you touch on the UI a little bit yeah I could do that um Let's see, what do we want to add to the UI? Um, let's add a restart button to the UI. So we got a button there we could click to restart instead of having to hit play each time. So I'm going to right click in here and go to UI. And then I'm going to find a button, add a button. If you're using older versions of Unity, I know buttons are not Text Mesh Pro by default. That is an option. If you do a Text Mesh Pro button, you're going to have to import this Text Mesh Pro Essentials. You don't have to worry about what it means. Just hit the button, it'll load in another folder into your assets, and then you're good to go. Okay. So now I'm going to click this 2D button up here. And it's going to take me into 2D mode. So, this button, if you remember way back when I was building the project and there was a template for 2D and 3D, this is the only difference between the two of them is whether or not this button is clicked when you start the project or not. But I'm going to click my canvas and hit F over here so it's kind of centered on my screen. So, Unity's UI is a bit buggy, a bit confusing at first until you really get used to it and know how it works. It is very, very useful, but it does take a little bit of time to get used to. You'll notice that when I added a button, it added in quite a few things. It added in this event system, it added in the canvas, it added in the button, and within the button, I've got a text mesh pro thing. So it adds in a lot of components. A canvas is you can think of it like a painting canvas. Um, everything that gets put on here is going to get painted onto your screen. Event system is related to the canvas. Event system handles all of your UI events. So if you're someone who's used to um, like Windows programming, you know you have your uh, event loops. This is kind of what handles those events. When you click, move your mouse, drag, and it's going to pass it on to the appropriate UI element. In the button instance, whenever we click on the button, it's going to trigger within this event system and then cause the button to react however we tell the button to react. Uh, 
If I go into my game screen, you see the buttons in this bottom left corner. When I'm in my scene view, see the button looks huge compared to the ground. But that's it's not really in relation to the ground. It's in relation to this canvas, and that's something that, that may be confusing to you at first. Um, if you are looking more into doing a canvas that's within your game, maybe I want the button to appear like right on this pipe, um, but then as we keep going, that button stays with that pipe. We're going to take our canvas and turn it from this render mode here, screen space overlay, into world space, or you can position it within the world, but most of the time you're going to want the screen space overlay, and that's going to cause this when you're in your scene view to look like this is huge compared to everything else in your game. It's really not, it's just the way it shows up within your scene view. Um, okay. So I've got this button here. Uh, right now, this button says button. I think we should make it say reload level or restart. So if I go into my button, expand it out, I got this text. Uh, if you're using Text Mesh Pro, you're going to have a component here called Text Mesh Pro. If not, I think it's just called text. And within that, there's this little text field where you can type whatever you want the button to say. I'm going to put restart. Now I want to position this button a little bit better. If you look over here, you know, we've been playing with this move, rotate, scale tool. But the rec tool is the one we're probably going to use most of the time whenever we're working with the UI. The rec tool lets you change the size of your buttons, uh, lets you change the pivot, which is this blue circle in here. And it's that pivot is going to affect if you rotate your, your button. It's going to rotate around that pivot. Maybe you want your restart button to be at an angle for some reason. You can do that. Um, and you can use all these same tools that we used before with positioning and rotation and scaling. Or you can use this, this rec tool, and it kind of puts everything all into one. So even rotating, I could rotate within using this rec tool. So I'm going to put it at an angle just because why not? Now, another weird thing about Unity's UI is getting used to these anchors and pivots and what all this means. These white triangles here, these are what's known as your anchors. And your anchors give the position relativity fitness, for lack of a better word. So this here, normally on a game object, you know, we've got this transform. Whenever we're in a UI element, we got this rec transform. It's a little bit different because this stuff at the top is going to be all relative to whatever your anchors are. And your anchors are going to be a number between 0 and 1 that refer to your screen position. A 0 is going to be equal to the left side of your screen and the bottom. And 1 is going to be the top of your screen and the right side. So if I have these anchors here, now whatever numbers are here are going to be relative to the edges of my screen. And this is kind of a good anchor position if you want everything on your canvas to scale relative to the size of your screen. So, uh, in my game view, I didn't show this before, but you have this option here. Right now it says free aspect. You could change the resolution that you're looking at something in. And you'll notice that really it messes with my UI depending on which one I select in here. Back when I had it free aspect, it looks good, but as soon as I change it, it it's all off. And that has to do with your anchors and your positions and getting everything set within here. Easy way to do this is to click in this box here, and it'll tell you different options here. It's hard to see on my screen if you're looking at it 
through Discord or on Twitch or anything, but these tell you kind of how you want it to appear. If you want it to be relative to the center of your screen, you could do that. So if I do that and I position this over here, when I go to my game view, it's going to be there. If I switch to a different view, it's always going to be relative to the center of that screen. If instead I set it up to the, the top left corner, I'll put it back up here. Now, whenever I change my resolution, it's always going to maintain that offset relative to that top left corner. So, this is a very easy way to kind of make sure your UI is behaving the way you want it to. Um, now, it also says here shift also set pivot. And if you don't know what that means, Pivot is that, that blue circle I uh, showed you whenever you're in your, your uh, rec tool. Let's move that around. If you hold shift whenever you click one of these things, it's going to move that pivot as well as moving the position anchors where you're relative to. If you don't hold shift, Whenever you click these, it's not going to move that pivot around. And you may think that's a better way to do it. And you are probably right. So I'm not sure why people would want to move the pivot. I'm sure there's some case where you would. But um, if you've already positioned your element wherever you want it and you, you like it, you know, I really like it in the top left corner. And I'm just going to go ahead and hit, I want that relative to the top left corner. That way, whoever's playing the game, that button's always going to be up there. All right, so I got a reset button, restart. I hit play, and I fell down. I explode. I hit restart, and nothing's happening. And that's because we got to make it do something. So I'm going to create a new script. And call it Scene Reloader. Because all I want it to do is reload the scene that I'm currently in. So right now I'm in this main scene. I want it to reload main. So I'm going to double click that. All this stuff that's already here, I don't need it. I just need a function here called Reload Scene. If I get this red warning, because I need to return something, I don't want to return anything, so it's void. Now, scene management in Unity is going to be controlled by a subset of the Unity engine called scene management. And you'll have to add it in whenever you want to do anything with loading scenes or changing scenes. It's just using Unity engine.scene management. And then if you want to access things, you're going to type in scene manager. And that's how you're going to do stuff. So scene manager dot load scene. Because I want to load a scene. And I want to load the scene that I'm currently in. So to do that, I've got to ask the scene manager what scene I'm in. So I'll go scene manager dot get active scene. So that will return the scene I'm in. And I've got red here, so I'm missing something. If I hover over load scene, I tell the sense will say load scene by its name or index in build settings. So I need an index of the scene. So I'll just go here and type build index. Save that. Go back into Unity. And then if I click on my button, now scroll down to the bottom, you'll have this on click. So it says list is empty. I'm gonna hit a plus sign here. I need to add in my scene reloader to the game object. So I'm just dragging that in here. Now once it's in my game object, I can add it up. Just drag and drop it up into that little square. It says no function, but I'm gonna click that, go to 
scene reloader and find my function. And right now my function isn't showing up. And if you run into this issue, it is a access modifier issue. So right now my function's private. I need to make it public so that Unity can see that function. So I'll go down now, scene reloader, and find my function called reload scene. And I'm gonna hit play. Bird crashes, I'll hit restart, and it reloads the level. Right. Um, anything else anyone would like to see? Any questions? Some neat things you could do with kind of the, the way we got our code set up is we can change our camera a little bit if we want. So maybe we don't want it to, to be purely up and down view. We could change our camera so it looks like this. And now since we've got our, our follow cam script set up, it's going to just follow along just fine. And if you notice, the ground is kind of flashing a little bit. That's that I mentioned that I created a visual bug earlier. And that's called Z buffering. Very common visual bug. And it happens when two objects are at the exact same position. And you can easily fix it by just making sure they're not exactly the same. So in this case, I'm just going to take the scale of this one, put it down a little bit. See those dash lines went away. As soon as I change that scale a little bit, it doesn't have to be much at all, just so they're not exactly on top of each other. Um, three more minutes, so anybody have any requests of something they want me to throw on here? Maybe some music. Music? Yeah, we can do music. All right. So music's easy to add in. I'm just going to create an empty object and call this our music player. And within here, I'm going to add a audio source. And all I've got to do is find that music clip I want, have it in my assets folder, and drag it into audio clip. I have it play on awake. Probably want it to loop if it's my game music, so check that. If you don't have any music, or you don't know how to make any music, you could always use your asset store. Go in through Unity Asset Store, find things there. Um, see, opengameart.org is a great one for finding things. I'm not sure if my sound is coming through on Discord. But. I'll take this file. Put it into my Unity folder. And just make sure you put it into your Assets folder. And when you do, when you go back into Unity, it'll import your file.
file here. And I'll go back to my unit music player and add in that music. Um, can you guys hear my music? Is it coming through Discord? Could be. Yeah. Like, we can't hear it. Can't hear it? Okay. You'll hear it on Twitch. But it is playing. So, just so you know, it is playing. When I hit the play button. And whenever I hit restart, it's going to restart the music. If you don't want your music to restart whenever you hit restart, um, if you know what a singleton pattern is, you can do that on your music player. Um, if you don't know what it is, just Google it and copy the code and you put it on there. Um, but that's music. Sound effects can be done the same way with an audio source attached, or you can add it within your code itself. So if I want to add a jump sound effect to my bird, I'll go into my jump function. I'm going to go audio source dot play clip at point, and then I'll pass in a clip. So I need to expose that in Unity. So do serialize field audio clip. And then I'll pass in my jump sound effect and I'll pass in my transform.position. So now whenever I jump, it will play my jump sound. Uh, if I do it right now, it's going to give me an error every time I push the jump button. And if you look at this error, it's that same unassigned reference exception error that we got before. And if you double click on it, it'll take you right to the code. If you read through what it says, it'll tell you that there's nothing assigned to jump SFX. So you would want to surround this code with an if statement that says if jump SFX is not equal to null. And we're going to try and play it. But if I have that um, unity, I just go back to my chicken and I'd, whatever sound effect I have, I would add it into that jump sound effects. If I want a sound to play when the chicken explodes, I could modify my prefab too. So I double clicked on it and I'm editing the prefab itself. I could add an audio source here and have my explosion sound into this audio clip so that whenever it explodes, it'll make an explosion sound. So that's the different ways you could go about doing music and sound effects at a very basic level. Very easy to do it with just using audio sources. If you want to get more into the audio, you can look into audio mixers and how those work. Unity Docs are very, very well well done. If you search into Unity Docs for um, anything in audio, there's a lot of stuff in there you could look at and great examples. Um, so with um the function uh, play clip at position, um like stop the stop the music and play but play the sound of the jump. Uh, great question. So it will not. Um, if I'm using this audio source, that play clip at point, this is going to create a new. I'll show you. Um, I'm going to have to add something to it. I don't have another audio clip at the moment, so I'm just loading in that one. But um, if you look over. In my hierarchy, whenever I jump, you're going to see that one-shot audio pops up. 
Okay. And cool. that one shot audio is going to play whatever sound it is, and then it's going to destroy itself as soon as the sound is done playing. So it will not take over the audio source that's tied to our music player. Um, if you really start stressing the audio system, I think there is uh, maybe like 64 clips can play at the same time or something like that, unless you add in audio mixers. And then you could add in a lot more sounds, but you very most likely will never get to the point where you're going to overload the audio system. Unless we try. Yeah, you could try. Um, well, even if you do, uh, it actually stops playing the first one. I think it goes in order. Yeah, uh, I think so. So I think it's like 30. Something like that. Yeah. It, ran into that some power some, up to you. Ran into that and some. But yeah, very cool. Um, I guess I do want to point everybody over to um, our Global Game Jam site. The link. It'll, I'll drop a link in the description and also in the Discord as well. Uh, so you can all sign up. Also, will the um, Global Game Jam be an in-person event or online? Uh, that Friday, no, next Friday. We will be in person at the uh, University of Memphis, uh, but only for that Friday. Uh, so we'll watch the keynote address and do like team building and whatnot. Then we're going to go online and jam for the next week. And then on Sunday, the 30th, we'll be back at uh, U, of, U of M to do the presentations and whatnot. Kind of doing a, a hybrid approach here. Hopefully nobody catches the plague. But um, uh, wait, it, it was a week event, right? Yes. Uh, okay. Ten days. Very okay, cool. Also, um, I just saw Chrism Shadow do this line thing. And I was just wondering what he did to do that. The uh, line render. Yeah. So all I did was add in a line render component. I just hit. Uh, I was on the chicken, and I hit add component. Type in line render. Uh, trail render actually for this one because um, it's trailing okay. it. Yeah. And then you could adjust the size of it, the colors of it, yeah. all these options. You make it however you want. When you first create one, though, it, it's whatever you add is going to look purple whenever you run it. And even when you change your color, it's going to look purple because you need to assign material to it. And just this default material that Unity has in there. Works perfectly fine if you just want a solid color. Yep. It's a fun, easy visual effect to add in. Also, David, one more other thing. Um, you does the uh, get game jam start on the twentieth or on the twenty first? Uh, it technically starts on the twenty first, that Thursday, but we're getting together that Friday on the twenty first. So we can start earlier, right? Like the twentieth. You could. Yep. I'm not gonna throw you in jail. Uh, any more questions for me before I uh, 
shut this all down, stop sharing my screen. Yeah, is that um trial renderer a package you have to download, or just already in the base and the so, base unit of Unity? Yeah, trail render is already in there. Um, there's a lot of things that are already in here that you have to install, but like I just added in post processing. But a lot of the stuff is already in there, and you don't have to worry about it at all. You just click that add component, and then start typing it in. It'll pop up. Now I'm just adding in some post processing. It's real quick, just to add a little visual flair to it. But definitely not needed. You definitely have to keep in mind with the post-processing uh, which uh, platforms you'll be publishing to because on like mobile um, these effects can uh, really have an effect on your on your frame rate as well. Yeah, they can. Um, if you're using built-in render, it's usually not too bad. But if you have a bunch of different effects in there and you're using a bunch of different volumes then yeah it, it will bog it down very fast um, i typically just use one volume if i'm doing just like a game like this oh, yeah, so, it, um, what object are you doing the process process i see on so right now i've got everything on the camera okay cool yeah. okay, if you're so using the built-in post processing you have to have Three things, you have to have a post-processing layer, post-processing volume, and a post-processing profile. And the profile is an asset, so you gotta create it in your assets folder, and that's where all your effects go. Um, but on the, the camera, I add in a post-processing layer and a post-processing volume, and I set the volume to global. And in your layer, you have to set the layer to everything, otherwise, It'll only apply the effects to some objects or not all the objects. Grain's a really cool one if you like grain. Isn't there also an option on the camera that you have to enable for post processing? Did they change that? I think they changed it. As long as you add in a post processing layer, Okay. No, there used to be I like a, a weird checkbox that you had to check for post processing. Yeah, but that may have been it was. versions ago. I know back in five it was a huge pain to do post processing. Now it's it's quite easy. I like this it looks like kind of like a CRT. Oh, we could do scan lines on there. Oh yeah, I don't know if you could do it with the default effects or if you'd have to create your own. Make it black and white, just make it look like the 1950s. You can do that too. You got color grading in here. Um, shoot, maybe do you want to saturate it? There we go. <laughs> and I'm gonna change my camera to orthogonal perspective. Yeah, you could really get creative with it. Um, 
But like you've seen, all this is just taking a matter of seconds to drastically change the way it looks. The main thing is getting your game set up, and then once you've got it all set up, you can play around with it and make it look however you want. That's cool. All right, guys, and, we'll go ahead and uh, start wrapping it up now. Yep. All right, that's it. Good deal. I'd have to do that somewhere else. All right. Um, do you want me to put a repo of this up somewhere? Yeah, that'd be cool. Okay. Yeah, just uh, send me the link to it and throw it in the description. All right. I'll do it. All right. Stop cool. Good deal. All right. So, yeah, I guess we will um, see all of y'all next week. Okay. Awesome. awesome. All right, see you guys. All right, y'all have a good night. You too. Good night. Good night.